If you would, turn with me in Philippians to chapter 4. We'll be starting in verse number 10. We're going to read the whole passage for context, but we'll be only focusing on the first five verses today as we look at this vitally important but so often mysterious and elusive attitude and mindset of contentment. Philippians 4, verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent help sent me help for my need once again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that at now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, We are so often distracted by what's going on in the world around us, our circumstances, what we have or what we don't have. God, help us to fix our eyes on you. Help us to trust you. Help us to know you. Help us to find peace, joy, unity, contentment in your Son. Help us to trust your providence and sovereignty in every aspect of our life. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So as we come to this last section in the book of Philippians, Paul focuses in on one of the main themes of the book, and that is contentment. As we have studied the book, looking at what it means to rejoice together We have looked at what it means to have true joy, peace, humility, and unity. And now we're going to look at what it means to have true contentment. Last week, Seth challenged us to examine our thinking and our believing. These commands throughout the book of Philippians for every believer to have and live in true joy, peace, humility, unity, and contentment never start with our doing but always start with what we are thinking and believing. We're called to fix our heart and our mind on the Lord and the things of the Lord. We are called to turn our eyes on Jesus, dwelling on Him who is worthy of all of our praise. When we focus and dwell on Jesus, our thinking and believing will drastically be changed. We will have and live in true joy, peace, humility, unity, and contentment. So what is contentment? Contentment is so often grasped at in our world but never found. A basic definition of contentment would be a state of happiness and satisfaction. The mindset that you have enough. Think about that and how that's lacking in our world today. A state of happiness and satisfaction, the mindset that you have enough. And I think that if you ask most people in today's society, 
that that's how they would view contentment, this, this state of happiness that I have enough. And while this definition isn't wrong, it falls short of what Paul is talking about in verse 11 when he says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Why can Paul say this with such confidence? Because he had fixed his heart and mind on the Lord and the things of the Lord. He had turned his eyes upon Jesus, dwelling on him who is worthy of all praise. He understood that what true contentment is, he understood what Christian contentment is. Paul had a state of happiness in Jesus. Paul was satisfied and found full satisfaction in Jesus. Paul had enough in Jesus. Paul wasn't looking at his circumstances. He wasn't looking at what he had, his possessions, or what he didn't have as he sits in a jail cell. He was looking to Jesus for happiness, satisfaction, and fulfillment. So true contentment finds happiness, satisfaction, and fulfillment in Jesus in every aspect of our lives. So how many of us can honestly say that we find happiness, satisfaction, and fulfillment in Jesus in every aspect of our lives? I know that many times I personally fall short of this command for true contentment because my eyes, mind, and heart are preoccupied with circumstances or possessions instead of Jesus. As we begin to view true contentment, as finding this happiness, satisfaction, and fulfillment in Jesus in every aspect of life. As I was studying, uh, there were four quotes that just stuck out to me as they explained contentment. And so I'm going to read them, and hopefully they're in your version app. You can go back and read them throughout the week, and hopefully they can um, help you as you think about what contentment is as they describe it. Jerry Bridges writes, God does nothing or allows nothing without a purpose. His purposes, however mysterious and inscrutable they may be to us, are always for His glory and our ultimate good. God does nothing or allows nothing without a purpose. And it's always for His good and our, for His glory and our ultimate good. David Brainerd, writing in his journal, wrote, my soul was sweetly resigned to God's disposal of me in every regard. And I saw there had nothing happened to me but was best for me. John Stott, writing on the subject of Christian contentment, writes, contentment is the secret of inward peace. It remembers the stark truth that we brought nothing into this world and can take nothing out of it. Life, in fact, is a pilgrimage from one moment of nakedness to another. So we should travel light and live simply. Our enemy is not possessions, but excess. Our battle cry is not nothing, but enough. We've got enough. That's kingdom-minded living right there. That's what Paul's getting at. To be content in Christ. To not look at our things and our possessions, but to look to Jesus for satisfaction. To look to his kingdom. Lastly, Jeremiah Burroughs writes in his classic work on Christian contentment, the rare jewel of Christian contentment. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. I hope these quotes will give you something to look back at and consider throughout the week as you try to reframe your mind around what it is to turn your eyes on Jesus, to find happiness and satisfaction in Jesus for every aspect of life, and maybe as you try to redefine what contentment actually is in your life. True contentment, Christian contentment, 
is found throughout the Bible, especially throughout the Psalms. David speaks of this true contentment in Psalm 23 where he proclaims, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He also boldly and emphatically sings of this true contentment in Psalm 16 where he declares, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. See, he understood that contentment lies in our satisfaction in who God is, who Jesus is. Paul speaks of this true contentment also in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where he proclaims, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Paul wasn't discontent with his circumstances. He wasn't looking around saying, well, I don't have this or my body's failing me. He, he, he took it as a chance to rejoice in the power that Christ was working in him. So as we focus and dwell on Jesus, building and fortifying this mindset and attitude of true contentment, where we find satisfaction, happiness, and fulfillment in Jesus in every aspect of our life, I think we have to ask ourselves, what stops most of us from consistently living this way? Because I think if we really look at ourselves and search, most of us don't live a life of true contentment. Why do so many of us struggle to have this true contentment? Why do we live such discontented lives? So what is discontentment? We know what contentment is. What is discontentment? And what is the danger of it? Discontentment comes when we look for happiness, satisfaction, and fulfillment in people and things rather than Jesus. Discontentment festers when our eyes are fixed on our circumstances and our relationships rather than our Creator and our Redeemer. We live in a society that is endemic with discontentment. A great example of discontentment is advertising on TV. If you watch TV for any length of time, you're going to watch commercials. And those commercials are going to tell you that you need something. So you can't watch a commercial without the realization that something is missing from your life. See, these commercials have gone from making you think that you want some product now to telling you that you need this product. You need this thing in your life for happiness, satisfaction, and fulfillment. So people rush out to buy the newest vehicle, phone, device, house, gaming system or whatever gadget is portrayed as going to make my life easier in a vain attempt to be happy, satisfied, and fulfilled. In an all too short amount of time, the house needs fixing, the car has lost its new car smell, the phone or the device or the tablet needs updated constantly to work as it was advertised to work. It needs the new software, the newest update. And that thing that was going to make your life easier has has failed to fulfill its promise. We will never truly know contentment while we're looking for happiness, satisfaction, and fulfillment in people and things rather than Jesus. So we must recognize discontentment as sin. Jerry Bridges says that many Christians view discontentment as what we would call a respectable sin, something that's not that bad, it's justifiable. And I'm sure as I say that, there's more than one person listening that bristles when, when they hear the thing that we must recognize discontentment as sin. You say, well, shouldn't I be 
discontent with sin in my life? Shouldn't I be discontent with injustice in the world? Shouldn't I be discontent with racism, partiality, and abortion that's so prevalent in the world today? Yes, there is a place for holy discontent for sin and injustice when our eyes are fixed solely on Jesus for our satisfaction, happiness, and fulfillment. However, most of us aren't truly discontent about sin and injustice because our eyes are fixed on Jesus. We are most often discontent discontent with sin and injustice, not because it wages war on a holy God, because it wages war on one of our heart idols of power, approval, comfort, or security. And most of the time, we aren't even discontent about sin. We're discontent about our circumstances of where God has us in life. Well, not all discontentment is sin, We must be willing and ready to continually examine our hearts and our minds. Discontentment should be a warning sign to the believer for the potential that sin is creeping into my life in some way because my eyes are not fully fixed on Jesus for happiness, satisfaction, and fulfillment. We must be quick to recognize sin, discontentment as sin, and root it out of our lives. In an article on Christian contentment, Rick Azell writes, Discontentment has the potential to destroy our peace, rob us of joy, make us miserable, and tarnish our witness. We dishonor God if we proclaim a Savior who satisfies and then live discontent. We can't declare with David, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. The Lord is my chosen portion in my cup. You hold my lot. You make known to me the paths of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And then walk around in an attitude and mindset of discontent over circumstances and possessions. We must focus and dwell on Jesus. Building and fortifying this mindset and attitude of true contentment where we find happiness, satisfaction, and fulfillment in Jesus in every aspect of life. Believer, since Jesus and the gospel brings joy, unity, and peace, we are called to be content in Christ. Christian contentment knows, trusts, and finds joy and peace in God's sovereignty and providence in every aspect of life. Christian contentment knows, trusts, and finds joy and peace in God's sovereignty and providence in every aspect of life. So if you turn back to our verses in Philippians chapter 4, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. If we're going to know and live in true contentment, Christian contentment, we must know, trust, and find joy and peace in God's sovereignty and providence in every aspect of life. We must find happiness, satisfaction, and fulfillment in Jesus. And we need to understand some things about contentment in the Bible. Excuse me. Contentment is a command. The Bible not only identifies contentment as a virtue, but speaks of contentment as a command. Paul says, In whatever situation I am, to be content. He doesn't say, Whatever situa- situation I am, to find contentment, to, wh- to what 
whatever situation I am in to find happiness. But he says, in whatever situation I am, to be content. This is not some stoic mantra that we rise above our circumstances and just be happy. This isn't this enlightened Buddhism where we just rise above our circumstances and find our inner peace and strength. This is Christian contentment where we are content in Christ. That doesn't mean that there's not a place for sadness. Christian, it is okay to be sad, but it's not okay to live joyless and without hope. This is not a che- another checklist item. And I just need to walk around. I just need to be content. Just be content and check it off for the day. We are called to fix our heart and mind on the Lord and the things of the Lord. We are called to turn our eyes on Jesus, dwelling on Him who is worthy of our praise. We need to remember that Jesus is the source of our true joy. Not only is contentment a command, Contentment comes from a lifestyle of rejoicing. Paul starts this passage with, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Remember back just a few verses, the command in Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. This is a command to keep on rejoicing. Make a continual, habitual practice of rejoicing. In one way or another, We are told to do this 70 times throughout the New Testament. Rejoice, 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 be happy, be joyful, sing, shout for joy. But now for the rest of the story. So many of us, including myself, rather than rejoicing, walk around all ho-hum because of our circumstances. We didn't get what we wanted Life is harder than we think it should be when we're called to rejoice, not because of what we have, but whose we are. We're called to rejoice and fix our eyes on Jesus. We're called to find our happiness, satisfaction, and fulfillment in Jesus in every aspect of our life. Next, contentment encourages us to look vertically to God. You are to be content because you understand that an utterly and totally, infinitely and supernatural, resourceful God has promised that He will never leave you or forsake you. A lack of contentment causes me to look horizontally at what other people have and what I don't have, and so I'm never satisfied. Contentment invites me to look vertically at God, When I look in His direction, regardless of my possessions or lack of status, I know that He is enough. My contentment lies not in what I have, but whose I am. Contentment allows us to boldly cry out with the psalmist, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Contentment finds satisfaction and sufficiency in Jesus. Paul said prior to this in chapter 3, but whatever gain I had, I counted loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Before we can be content in Christ, we have to know Christ. He's not, he's not discontent because of his circumstances, but he's rejoicing in his circumstances because he knows Christ. And all of the things that he suffered or gained, he counts them as loss for knowing and gaining Christ. Contentment will find satisfaction and sufficiency in Jesus as we remember the cross. When we stand before the cross and we realize the magnitude of our sin, but the magnitude of God's grace and mercy, we can't help but be content. Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us, but that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Contentment finds satisfaction and sufficiency in Jesus as we preach the gospel to ourselves. The greatest remedy for discontentment is preaching the gospel to yourself. If you feel discontent, if you're struggling with contentment, stew on the gospel, meditate on the gospel, preach the gospel to yourself, and you will find contentment in Jesus. Contentment will find satisfaction and sufficiency in Jesus as we remember our union with Christ. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christian, you are unified with Christ. If you are a believer, you stand before God justified. You stand before God as his child. And so we can have contentment in that. No matter what we have or don't have, in Christ we have our greatest treasure. Next, we find contentment is learned. Content, there's not a book on five easy steps to contentment. Contentment isn't something that we're just going to get. Paul says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. And we look at Paul um, really from the, a biblical perspective, this somewhat superhero of the Christian faith. And he's even telling us he had to learn contentment. And so I find that encouraging. Contentment is learned through difficulty. Contentment is learned through circumstances. But contentment is learned through knowing, trusting, and finding joy and peace in God's sovereignty and providence in every aspect of our life. When we know God, when we trust God, when we find joy and peace in God, in God alone, we will be content. Paul shares this song of learned contentment in Romans 8, where he says, For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. So all of these different circumstances, all of these different things, all of these different powers, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And in that, Christian, there is true contentment. Learned contentment sits at the table of Psalms 139 and confidently knows that a sovereign loving God created us in our mother's womb. He protects me and he leads me in every aspect of my life. And such knowledge is too wonderful for me. So I trust and I praise him in every circumstance. Next, we learn that contentment is non-circumstantial. Paul says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. He can endure all things. He can do all things that God has called him to do through the power that Christ Jesus had given him. This isn't some platitude Paul is talking about. Paul had sat at Lydia's table, who is this described as this rich woman, and now he's sitting in prison, destitute and without. He had no plenty. He had no nothing. It. This isn't on the screen, but if you would turn, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And um, it's in, let's see, verse number 21. But whatever else, but whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking of a, as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they all the offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? 
I am a better one. I am talking like a madman. He knew what it was to be at the top of the table, a Pharisee of Pharisees. Rich, wealthy. He was a Roman citizen, so he, he, he lacked for nothing. But then he says, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with a rod. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brothers, and toil and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. He knew what we consider the greatness of abundance and the pain of having nothing, and yet he says he was content on either side of the road because he had his eyes and mind focused on Jesus. Paul knew that greatness, riches, and fame. He knew that pain, destitution, imprisonment, yet he was content. His contentment was the result of bowing his heart and mind to the will of God, no matter what condition that he faced. Paul confidently knew that he could endure all things through Christ. By Christ's strength, he could be calm in adversity, and he could be humble in prosperity. Paul had his eyes fixed on Jesus for happiness, satisfaction, and fulfillment in all aspects of his life. And by Christ's strength, we too can confidently do all things that Christ has called to do with true contentment. Next, contentment creates a radically changed value system. If you think of the world around us and what it means to be content, it means to have Whatever makes me happy, whatever the newest and best gadget is, but true contentment, Christian contentment, knows, trusts, and finds joy and peace in God's sovereignty and providence in every aspect of our life. This contentment finds happiness, satisfaction, and fulfillment in Jesus, not things or possessions. My contentment lies not in what I have, but whose I am. And when I realize whose I am, my value system is radically changed. Contentment comes from a transformed mind. Think back to last week, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. We must fix our eyes and mind on, upon Jesus, dwelling up only on Him who is worthy of our praise. As we focus and dwell on Jesus, we need to pray that He builds and fortifies in us this m- mindset of true contentment. Contentment belongs to those who are focused on the well-being of others. Paul earlier had said in Philippians chapter 2, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And now he says in this passage, I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. See, it was this Philippian Philippian church, it had been many, many, many years since he had seen them. And he he doesn't assume that they've forgotten about him. He assumes that 
they didn't have any opportunity to send money to him, that they didn't have any opportunity to help them, that they were promoting the gospel and he assumes the best for them because his eyes were focused on Jesus and not his circumstances. He wanted what was best for that church. He was concerned for their well-being. And the Philippian church was concerned for his well-being. We'll find out next week how they were concerned for him and how they sent help to him. But there was a mutual concern for each other in the Lord. And when we struggle with contentment, it's because we're more concerned about ourselves than Jesus and the people who Jesus have died for. If we spent more time praying for other people than worrying about ourselves, we would be able to see this true contentment more in our lives. And lastly, we see contentment is grateful. He ends this passage with, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. See, Paul doesn't just branch over it and says, I'm content. I didn't really need your help. He's not, he's not ungrateful. He's deeply concerned about this Philippian church, and he's so grateful that they would even think of him in his time of need and send help for him. But more importantly than he's grateful to the Philippian church and the service to him, he's grateful to God. That God had grown in this church the gospel message to be content in Christ. That they would even think of him and not think of themselves, but they, they would empty themselves like Christ's example, and at great cost to them, send him help. They had learned the secret of fixing their eyes on Jesus, dwelling on him who is worthy of all praise. Christian contentment knows, trusts, and finds joy and peace in God's sovereignty and providence in every aspect of our life. Christian contentment finds satisfaction and fulfillment in Jesus in every aspect of our life. Jeremiah Burroughs writes, To be well skilled in the mystery of Christian contentment is the duty, glory, and excellence of a Christian. It is a command for us to be content, but it's not an action item. It's not something that we have to do but it's something that we have to rest in Christ, turn our minds and our focus on Jesus, who is the source of true contentment. Can we say in whatever state we are that we are content? Can we say that we are content no matter what the circumstances are? Can we say that we are perfectly at peace and satisfied and that we have enough? And if we can't say that, we haven't fully obeyed this command to be content in Christ. And so we need to go to our knees and we need to look to Jesus, who is our true contentment. Let's pray.